All right, welcome to the 20 Years of Java panel at the Geek Out Conference. Ah. My name is Steven Chin. Um, we're broadcasting live at nighthacking.com. So you can go to the, the website and actually see all of us on live camera. And we have a wonderful live audience here in Tallinn, Estonia. So thank you guys very much for, for joining us at the conference here. Um, so, and our esteemed panel, um, I will let you guys, pass the mic this way, I'll let you guys self-introduce. So Marcus, why don't you yeah, say I'm, a little bit I'm yourself. Marcus, working for Red Hat as a developer advocate, talking about integration technologies and middleware. I love the Java community. All right, my name is Sven. Um, I'm also a dev evangelist um, for the technical uh, community. So, yeah, I love it too. I'm Anders Almerich. I work for Canoe in Switzerland. And I'm a Java champion. I love the Groovy and I especially love the Java community. Yeah, Konrad Malawski. I run a conference in Poland called Geekon, maybe uh, seven years now or so. And I work at TypeSafe on Akka. I'm Ed Burns and I work at Oracle. And uh, the Java community is what makes Java special among all of the software development technologies that have ever been, we've got the best community, and that's what's the best thing about it. Nice. OK, so today these guys are going to share some of their experiences over the past 20 years, um, memorabilia, stories, um, hopefully some of them funny, <laughs> about things which have been impactful um, regarding Java and also regarding things which you guys have been working on. So um, we're, who would like to, who's, who's got a good, a good Java memorabilia story to kick things off? Well, I could start with my litmus test that I've been talking to you about. Yeah. So in this 20-year retrospective meme that's going around, a lot of people are asking themselves, well, what, you know, how far back can you go with Java? And one way I often have, well, just recently uncovered to test people is to ask them if they know what the Java Gator is. Ah, oh, OK. So, so this is a, I think this is a good test for our local audience here in, so does in anyone, Estonia. Anyone, so we're gonna, we'll start with the panel. Anyone on the panel know what the Java Gator is? But does it count if we found out a couple nights at a party with you? <laughs> no. Let's, let's pretend I'm asking you this two weeks ago. Or... <laughs> okay. Panelists, who knows what the Java Gator is? Java Gator. Java Gator? Java Gator. Okay. I guess okay. That, that gives you your answer. So that's, that's, <laughs> so that's, that's dating. I, I've got the most gray hair on the panel here, although Sven's got some gray on the side. Um, the Javagator was a project at Netscape. Does anyone remember Netscape? Um, in December of 1998, to um, write a native browser in Java from scratch. And so this was when Netscape realized, well, it's probably time for us to rewrite everything, because the code that uh, they initially wrote was crap and, fa and just trying to get it done fast. So they said, how, you know, how can we restart it? And they were talking with Sun back then, trying to get this idea started. And it was a product that ran for about six months. And uh, you know, I, and thinking back on the history of Java, I try to think of turning points. And I think Java in the browser and where that went, whether it took off or not, is something that that's when the decision was made, you know, way back early then. If, if, if it had gone one way, if that project hadn't been canceled, maybe things might yeah, have been so very I different. Yeah, so I think, you know, like you, you, you're involved quite a bit in client Java, Andre. Yes, I do. And so can you imagine a world where all the modern browsers are running in Java code? Now just imagine if instead of writing JavaScript on the browser, everybody will be writing Java. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was the idea back then. Yeah. Right. So speaking of Java on the browser, anybody remember this guy? Hot <laughs> Java. <laughs> Hot Java, HTTP URL connection, Arthur Van Hoff. That was, uh, you know, one of the first prototypes. You know, it was trying to show, hey, we can load code over HTTP and, and bring it into a running VM and, and get it running without having to mess with um, linker options in a make file. Mm -hmm. So that was a big deal for me. Uh, when you come from C++ or any native environment, uh, the thing I hated most about it was dealing with make and uh, all the different linker options just to get 
dynamically compiled libraries should load correctly. Yeah, those were the times where we got the applets and we got the, the dancing duke and uh, the nervous text working and everybody got excited about being able to create animations and actually program animations to run on the browser. Uh, sadly, well, we know the story of the applets, they really never took off. Okay. So yeah, and so there's, uh, my, my history with Java is it's lots of ups and downs, right? Like, so over 20 years you get to think, oh, you're cool, you're not cool, you're cool again, you're not cool. But at some point, you get to be around long enough and you're like, well, if, if I'm still here, I must have some level of coolness. And I'm talking about not just me, me not me, I'm talking about <laughs> the technology itself, you know? So uh, the client side thing is, has been one of those ups and downs things. And it's, it's something that we never want to let go. And I think um, there's a lot more currency to that now because Oddly enough, the rise of Node has uh, brought to people's coolness meter this notion of, ooh, how great it is to have an end-to-end -end play. Oh, now JavaScript is an end-to-end -end play. And you know, that's what we've been trying to do with Java all along. And we have a really compelling end-to-end -end play. So I, I well, hope I, more people see that. I think now that. that we have a word for it, we were chatting about this the other night, but now yeah. that we have a word for it, maybe it'll actually be cool and something we'll actually want to do with Java. I'm sorry. I, now that there's a term for it, like an end-to-end -end play term, maybe it'll actually be something that we actually care about in the Java world. I, yes. Yeah. Right. That if, if it kind of, you know, the buzzword meter gets up to the executives, because that's what they listen to, and Gartner and such, this now this end-to-end -end play buzz might drive some more focus on Java okay. in the class. So, so speaking of things which kind of came and went, how about the Java ring? <laughs> well, the Java ring was a, a cool thing that came out. I think it was in Java 1, 98 or 99. Do you know what year it was? Which one they did that? 98? 98. Thanks. Thank you, Charles. Charles is a veteran also. <laughs> you should be on the panel. Yeah, and so this is, a, this is a classic. So I think, you know, everyone's walking around with their Android and Apple watches now. They really... That's like, that's like old technology. They should really be using their rings, their Java rings. Right, right. To check into their plane flights. So and to I, I don't know the Java ring. Can you please explain what, <laughs> what that was? So the, um, well, physically it was a you know, little ring holder and it, was, um, it had Java running on the little chip which magnetically plugged into the ring. It was a Java ME and you had a little sort of docking port you could put your ring in to authenticate exactly. yourself. And um, you, could, you could use little readers as well. So one of my friends actually hooked up his, um, his house. So he could use his Java ring to, as a secure entry into his home That's for his cool. home automation system. That is cool. <laughs> Do that with your Apple Watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so how many, how many of our participants are, are wearing funky, funky new style watches? OK, a couple. Yeah, the Germans. yeah, the Germans. <laughs> All right, well, we'll get you guys rings later, proper Java rings, and you can get rid of those silly watches. <laughs> well, I think that's another one of the turning point moments in the history of Java is what happened with Android, you know? And so that's, it's a, it's a, a fork that we're all now living with. And uh, as we continue to evolve Java, you know, with SE9 coming out, now we see that we have features in the language and Lambda, you know, they're never going to get, are they ever going to get Lambda and Android? Does anyone know? What is the question? If there's, if there's plans to do something like Lambda in Android? Well, no, I mean, they're lagging behind a little bit, but the, the interesting thing was still the Java ME movement, right? Mm -hmm. um, I actually did a bunch of Java ME apps, and then many, many years after Android came out, I don't know if many people realize how what the biggest kind of feature of Android is that you don't have to manually count screen size by pixels and then do math on the pictures you had in the application and do the manual rescaling. And some phone would support transparency and some phone would not tra support transparency. But it was really insane to do any mobile development. It was just impossible without having 20, 30 phones at home mm -hmm. and actually running on the real phone. 
because the emulators were just no good. So, yeah, that was a big, big turning point, actually making mobile development fun again and possible in some way. Right. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put something fun up. How about our little buddy here, Duke? So anyone, anyone want to describe the, the history of how the mascot came to be? Hmm. You know, I'm going to defer to you on that, because your excellent talk had that covered pretty well. <laughs> okay. So Although we, I, can, I, can, I can relate a story about uh, what it's like to be in the Duke costume. Oh, wow, you actually... Not me personally, but... I was going to say, you're a little tall for... <laughs> no, Dude, right. That would have been a really good story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so Duke started out as the, as the mascot for the, um, the Star 7 device, which um, the green team built, and this was the origin of the Java language. Um, and so I showed this yesterday in the presentation, but actually this is, uh, was actually before the iPad was, you know, cool. This was the iPad 20 years, well, maybe like, you know, 15 years before the iPad actually hit mainstream. Um, and they hammered together with components from like ripping open Game Boys and set, set top boxes and Walkman and all sorts of stuff to, to build a device and have a um, Java and this little mascot running on it. So the reason why Duke is so simple, you can see that his, um, his basic features are simple colors, very simple shapes and body, was um, because given the constraints of the system they were running on to have a easily visually recognizable mascot, that could have some like emotions and have a friendly appearance. This was um, what their designer came up with the best way of having like a friendly um, avatar. Yeah, I think the um, the speaker after me, his 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 analogy was this is the um, the paperclip. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is, like this the is something. Paperclip that's Java. something that Martin said yesterday that yeah. Duke's was supposed to be uh, Java's or Oaks Clippy, and that's funny because around uh, when the Duke. Um, was allowed to be used uh, freely. It was no longer under copyright. There is a 3D image of Duke and Tux battling against an army of Clippies. Yep. That, so. is, that was a very legendary t-shirt. So my story about the Duke costume was, it was like 2004, I think, and uh, this was when the open sourcing of Java first started. Yeah. And it took many, many years to uh, you know, actually get all the legal and the clean IP and finally get to the point where we could say, you know, open source, it's all open source. So it really started in 2004. And uh, at the time, we had, I don't know, it's Sun, it was still had a bit of a startup feel, even though it was still a, you know, a gigantic company at that point. But when I say startup feel, what I mean is people would do whatever was necessary, regardless of what their role was. So um, the, we had this girl on our team, Jennifer Douglas. She was the program manager that was helping us get JCP stuff done. So my yeah. little corner of the Java world is the JSF specification. And um, I would work with her, and she'd help me post my artifacts to jcp.org and make sure I had all the legal approvals and whatnot. Well, yeah, Je Jennifer is still, she's still working. Yes, she came she's back. back. She's back as part of the team now. That's awesome. Well, uh, one of the things she had to do was be in the Duke costume <laughs> at Java 1. And I'm like, yeah, oh you do my. it all. Wow. I, I should ask Jennifer about that next time I see her. Yep. She could tell you. Yeah. If, you should get her on a panel. She could tell you what it's like to be Duke. Yeah. No, I, um, I was hanging out in the, in the, um, the green room last year at, at Java 1 where you know, Duke was suiting and unsuiting. Right. And that... That was, that's like hard, that's like hard labor. Like she was sweating and like yep. working up because you have to like waddle and move and it's like. It's hot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, guys, do any of you know where the colors came from? Like why is Duke red while sun was blue? No, I don't know. I mean, it's a surprising good fit to today's Oracle. But um, I was wondering if that was a major decision driver well, for Oracle to take over sun. I don't know. There's, there's no story about that. I mean, you could often think someone with a red nose is a boozer, but I don't know if Duke was a boozer. All right. Let's, let's show another interesting picture here. So this is a um, 
car with some famous people inside of it. We've got Gosling and who are those other guys? Well, that's Neil John. Is, is that the Link Vault car? Yeah, yeah. It was I, an early Java car, and it, it was a Thunderbird? Is that what it is? What I do know is that it has an LCD screen in, uh, next to the uh, driving seat that displays a swing base UI for everything <laughs> that you can do in that car. Yes, and, and I believe we're talking about 2009. I know JavaFX was already out, and these guys still decided to use swing. <laughs> <laughs> Go swing! <laughs> yeah, well, it, you know, if they use your framework, they could freely choose between swing and JavaFX, right? Right. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about things you're most proud of about your association with Java. Can people share some of that kind of thing? All right, Marcus, you're on. Yeah, I'm always taking the not proud parts, right? Um, my worst moment looking back was kind of the takeover. I mean, Oracle buying Sun. That was pretty much an amazing ride of a couple of months where nobody really knew what Oracle is going to do with it. and. Um, I've been through that before with BA and Oracle. So I had some suspicions and fears at the end of the day. And that was, was a really rough time for me to stay with Java and Oracle and try to figure out how to make that community work under that new kind of host. So yeah, looking back, we've had ups and downs, I think. And we find, found kind of a stable position right now. I'm not happy with everything, and I pretty much, I'm German, I can't be happy with everything, right? So, um, but yeah, that was my, my saddest moment looking back. Yeah, so um, I think, I think too, so, so what, I, what I'm proud of with Java is, is actually the community. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I think, the most important part of Java, besides the language, but um, I, I really love the community, and also when uh, Oracle took, took over Java. I was a little bit concerned that Oracle will mess that up um, because they, they I, I thought they don't understand the community and I, I had the feeling in the first half, first year, um, there were some, some problems with that. Uh, but now sitting here 2015, I think the community is as strong as it was 10 years ago. So I think Oracle really, really got that figured out. Nice. Yeah, I think that the lesson learned is that the, the Java community is so strong that not even one big company like Oracle can put it down. And that everybody came together and helped Oracle see that where we want things to, to go. Of course, they, they can eventually say, no, we want to take the other path. But overall, actually, this thing works. So again, community really matters. But I think that the, other, that the other thing that really interests me is the vast majority of open source projects that you find. Uh, there are so many different things. There are even competing standards, and that's fine, because what we want is to have not just one voice, but multiple voices uh, uh, um, dealing and, and telling us where we can do things. Yeah, so. An interesting point that wasn't mentioned yet was uh, that actually after Oracle took over, I mean, the development of the VM sped up a lot. So before the takeover, Sun was well, kind of developing the VM, but not really. And there was this few years of stagnation. So actually many people started looking for other platforms during that time, during the last years of Sun because it was just not investing enough into development. They didn't have enough monies, basically. So, I mean, there was this fear that Oracle would, I don't know, kill it or do something bad about it. Like it did, um, well, the Jenkins and what was the name of Jenkins before? Hudson. Hudson, Hudson right? So that I know one a was thing actually about that. <laughs> we, that's actually still a product. <laughs> it, it is. So. It's kind of interesting that in that respect, in the technological respect, the takeover was actually a very positive thing. So if you look at the recent VM changes and you know the Lambda stuff, the Valhalla projects and everything, this wouldn't have happened without the takeover. So well, that was I think good it's things. worth pointing out that it has always been possible to do different alternate languages on the JVM, but 
not since, not until the Oracle takeover was it actually allowed, kind of, I, I don't want to say legally, but during the Sundays, it was frowned upon to do anything other than the Java programming language on the JVM. And some people did, but they never had the blessing of Sun. And after the Oracle takeover, it, it has opened up much more. So I, people often will take pot shots at Oracle and about it being not friendly to diversity and trying to be all closed, but that's something that you cannot refute. You have to observe that not until the Oracle takeover did other languages come along that were really... Because you mentioned in your talk that JRuby started, you know, what, 12, 13 years ago. Yeah, it, no, it has a very long history, but yeah. But it didn't really start to become super popular until after, I would say, the Oracle. Yeah. I yeah, exactly. I mean, Scala also 10 years old, but the, the big kind of let's really be nice about all these languages, that was also an Oracle thing, actually. Right. And nowadays, for, for new feature development, there's a lot of interaction between the language teams and yet the Oracle VM team. So it's a really healthy ecosystem now because the other languages did a bunch of crazy stuff and really avant-garde stuff, which is now, you know, getting fed back to, through the community back to the VM, so it's a healthy thing. Yes, yeah, that's true. Once Oracle took over, there was a, kind of like a renaissance of different languages, but there was a little bit of a um, migration period even when Song was there because they hired the JRuby team and the Jython team. And in the last two years, they actually started with a new conference called the JVM Language Summit, which I believe you guys have a couple of t-shirts yeah, to show. Yeah, this is the t-shirt. I had never been to this, so I feel a little uh, remiss in <laughs> demonstrating the t-shirt, but this is the JVM Language t-shirt. And yeah. uh, you've been to it, though. Yeah, I've been to one of them. And uh, I can tell you that's a regular attendee. Um, if you're not into the JVM internals, it was still a really nice place. It's a, you, you learn a lot. I actually felt like a mosquito on a windshield. There's so much great content to hear. It's, it's, it's incredible. And there's going to, since then, I think it was 2008 or maybe it's seven. I'm not exactly sure when it started, but they keep going every single year. And it's yeah, great so because People from different uh, languages and from, or from inside Oracle, they just come and share ideas and they make no, I'd, things I'd, better. I'd look at it as the, um, you know, like a conference like Geek Out, um, a lot of the folks who are working on the technology present to developers who are building things with it and like they give valuable experience. The JVM Language Summit, people who are implementing like Deep, really deep technical guts of the JVM are speaking to other JVM experts about like sharing best practices. So like the JVM language conference is like the, the conference for language implementers, whereas right. a lot of those folks are speakers at other conferences. And even, even before I joined Oracle, I would actually, I would watch the videos from the JVM language summit and there was really like a lot of deep, really good deep technical content. Those, those t-shirts that you were um, holding up earlier, hold them up again because I think it's, it's interesting to point out that um, these, well, now I'm going to get in trouble for this. These t-shirts these are not sanctioned by Oracle Marketing. <laughs> they're, they're actually designed by real geeks. And there's lots of little subtle jokes inside of each of the t-shirts if you look carefully at the symbology. Um, so like, you know, little, little tiny details about um, just a ruby and hey, look, a python hey, snake. Is this an Atlassian yeah. reference here? Yeah, Confluence. Yeah. All right. <laughs> is it, that, is, so, that sounds like Big Bucket. If you, if you look at all the little shapes and the symbology inside of that, that actually it was designed by the guys on the, um, the JVM team with the designer who they, they've been working with. And they just throw all these jigsaw. Yeah, jigsaw puzzle pieces. They throw all this like symbology and this ideas out here. And the, he creates it and turns those into... Um, interesting artistic renditions um, for the conference each year. So um, even if you can't make it out to Santa Clara to, to attend the conference, well, even if you can't get invited, even though you're local, <laughs> <laughs> because they're extremely picky about who can attend, um, all of the talks are going to be recorded again this year. And so you can, you can actually um, watch them on the Night Hacking channel. So I'll have them posted on the same channel where we're we're streaming the videos um, here from Geek Out. 
And I think it's, it's one of those things where you can, you can really get some like, interesting insights into the JVM and the future architecture that just you don't get that information anywhere else in the world. Nice. So let's, um, let's, let's look at some more of the artifacts. Do you have any more of the um, pictures and artifacts to show? Yeah, OK. How about sun? Sunspot, anybody? Sunspot. <laughs> That's a cool piece of, well, that was, in, in my opinion, one of the first Internet of Things things. I, yeah, I okay. still saw one of them in the original package last week at Greycon Copenhagen. There are nice. still week. some of them around a week ago. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, so this was, this was like a whole package in terms of having like accelerometer, temperature sensors, different sensors inside of a... Um, device. It had connectivity from the base station to the um, satellite station, so you could actually do proper like grid networking with the, a set of these devices. Um, and they were programmed using, uh, what was it? It's like a Java subset that compiles down to the device. I'm forgetting the name of the, um, the, um, the runtime for it. But um, you can actually... CLDC? No, 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 no. This is... Um, it's, a, it's an entirely different compiler because they had to compile down to a smaller chip architecture. This is okay. even less powerful than like J J2ME okay. phones. Um, no, no, it's, it's, it's pre-dates Java embedded. So it's, it's kind of funny that like these devices weren't actually cheap. Like a set of the um, sunspots would actually cost you, I don't know, they were selling it for like 400 to 600? I can't I remember think it was the like price range. But um, they actually were selling it at a loss because to manufacture these, they actually custom 3D printed it out of the, um, the Sun Campus, or later the Oracle Campus, um, like assembled it with expensive California labor. Right. Um, and nowadays, you can accomplish almost the same thing using, well, even more than you could with the Sunspot by just using commodity hardware like um, like Raspberry Pis, Java ME or Java FC embedded, um, hooking up very inexpensive hardware electronic sensors over GPIO. But like at the time, having a package where you could actually do all this was really great for research or um, humanitarian projects or other things they could do with the, the Sunspot package. Right. Um, another fun thing, I don't think you have a, a picture of it though, there was a the 10th a, data, a data center in a shipping container. Does anyone remember that? Uh, so they had this uh, road show they put together. Was, when you mentioned disaster relief and humanitarian things, the idea was, you know, when there's a disaster and all the network goes down, they would drop this shipping container in that would have like a, a Sun data center in it, and it would, you know, you plug it in, and then you have communications. And, <laughs> and they had this thing go on a tour around the country. You know, and I live in Orlando, Florida, which is quite a far away from uh, Silicon Valley. But that truck eventually made its way to Disney World. Nice. Yeah, it was a big 18-wheeler with Sun Microsystems on the side. It was pretty cool. So for that week, you guys were safe in Florida. If any disaster right. hit, hurricane or... <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you were covered. Nice. All right, so I have another one here, which is... Um, I think you have one of these right yeah. in front of you, but it's the... Tenth. This is the tenth happy tenth birthday, Java. Put it on this side. Oh, there you yep, go. Yep. Yeah, there we go. I, I took it off. There yeah. we are. All right. All right. I'll put the picture up again. So, um, tenth anniversary of Java. That that seems like that seems a long time ago. Right. And 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 so who does anyone remember <laughs> that famous and transformative book that really you know laid the foundation for everything that's happened in the last ten years? Bruce Tate's Beyond Java. Right. I, I think it's kind of funny to be here 10 years later and look back and say, well, beyond Java, all right, we're still here. We're still, we're still evolving. We're still we're doing still new using. stuff. Well, I mean, there's been a lot of evolution both in the language and also in um, like Scala and libraries running on top of the JVM. So it's, it's still Java technology, but it's perhaps quite a lot different in terms of the... Um, the evolution of what people actually are using, like framework-wise, language-wise, feature-wise, on the platform. 
Yeah, but the, the um, Java has been so stable. Yeah, uh, we're thinking, or we're already talking about OpenJDK 10, and that's supposed to come out at least three years and a half from now. And any features that do not make it to 10 will certainly make it to 11. And there are also talks about maybe we can push this later in order to make it much more better than, than before, or what, what can we do? So five years from now, we're still thinking what's going to happen with Java. It's not like, it's not going to be there in five years. Well, so let me take this opportunity to ask the panel if they have any feelings about the open sourcing of the Swift programming language that was announced at WWDC last week. Yeah, was that, uh, what does that mean for Java? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I do. Um, it's mainly, at the moment, it's thought to be a client programming language. So Java starts to actually have all its strength on the server side, to me personally. Java FX is kind of around. I'm still a little bit unhappy about the improvements recently. We'll see what happens. So that could be a that could be really a big thing uh, in terms of a threat to all Java client side models. And I think iOS development and mobile devices that fits pretty well. So that could be kind of a new standard. Um, open sourcing in general is great, like you all know. And on the other hand, I heard some more rumors about porting it to Linux and macOS. So that might even open up that space for developers. So we'll see. Um, it kind of reminds me about Node.js and JavaScript making all its way to the server. So that might be a first new step for the programming language that gains some more traction. Right. So I guess it just goes to show that there's still a lot of competition you know, in this space. And I think we, as the Java community, should probably try to do a better job of reaching out and connecting with people that are coming out of university. Because I don't know if the kids that are coming out of university, and I can say kids, I'm old enough, that are coming out of university these days would consider Java as their first choice. I don't know. What do you guys think? Anyone younger here that would? Well, the thing is, while I may think Java is a great platform, but the problem is, um, well, what does everybody have installed already on their computer? Well, right. a web browser. So what do you have in a web browser? Well, you could run an applet, but no one really does that nowadays. Everything's JavaScript. so. Uh, with great pain, I would say, yeah, JavaScript has this big win of it's already there. And this is what people start with nowadays. So, And then they discover they actually need static typing, but that's a few years in once you have this mud ball application. But. Okay. So um, to kind of close out the panel, I want to ask you guys a final question and give you each a chance to kind of, and you, you get an option here. So you can either make a, a prediction about the future of Java, or you can make a, a request mm -hmm. <laughs> about something which you'd really like to see become part of Java in the next five years. So what's your either prediction or request for the future Java? Um, approximately five year time span horizon for what you, what you think matters. Well, I would say it's important to not give up. You know, we, have, we still have a lot to offer, and uh, we, uh, we have to show the world that we have a really great system for dealing with c concurrency and complexity and scale. And, you know, we've, we've figured out, uh, we, we've taken the lessons of computer science that came many, many decades before Java and, and put them in there. And so just the foundations are important, and, and Java is a good way to to show that foundations are important. Don't reinvent the wheel. OK. So you want more of the same? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep up the fight. Yeah, I do have a request, actually. So it's actually nowadays when I think about Java, the JVM, I mostly think about the JVM, because that's where everybody gets the benefits if we improve stuff. And nowadays, it's this move of we have these multi-core, massive multi-core machines, and we can leverage them to a certain extent, but we cannot leverage all of the, what they have to offer because we are too far away from the machine. We are really, really far away from it. And this is, yeah, that's a good thing in one way, but it's a bad thing if we really want to go into high-performance stuff because you can't do the OS-level things. 
So I think the VM needs to go more into the direction of actually exposing a bit of the operating systems it runs on. So yeah. that's both yeah. a prediction and a request. So that's kind of a prediction, but also I think it's related to what you're currently working on. on Yes and no. I mean, everybody at some and, point needs you know, uh, actors and to scale your application. And if the VM does it better, everybody, every language, yeah. every tool gets the benefits. So, so, so you, you want the benefit personally as well as? Yeah, personally as well. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are things we would like to have that Linux has, but we can't call into it unless we go native. So it yeah. would be nice to have it exposed. Andre? I guess, well, no surprise, my request will be to keep the desktop alive. Uh, as, as we saw yesterday on the video from Jace Gosling, there, we know there are things that you cannot write on mobiles, that you cannot write using HTML or JavaScript. For that, we have other options, and I believe the options that we have inside the JVN are great, and that can continue to be uh, greatly improved, uh, but for some reason, uh, we keep talking about that HTML is the future. Well. It's actually kind of like a combination. So the desktop is still matters. The desktop is still important. So let's keep it going. Yeah, so um, I, I would like to, and I agree with, with Ed here, um, keep, keep, on, keep on the fight. That's, that's a good thing. Um, and I think we, we should look at, at uh, young people and teach them Java when they come out of university. They have these, these, these systems already in place when they, when they go to a real job. And I would think we should, we should really keep, keep up the fight and uh, teach the young generation also Java because we have a great platform here. We have, we have a great language, a great platform, and just, just keep it up. Yeah, th thankfully Java is a little bit more than just the programming language. So um, I, as a middleware guy, I'd actually love to see some more flexibility when it comes to specifications. Um, I mean, E8 being just pushed out for good reasons. Um, I still think that we're, even if we still pull that excuse like it's a standard, we don't need to be bleeding edge, but we definitely need to have a lot more flexibility in defining those standards, adding to them. Um, I think profiles would be a great fit to it. Um, Java E started with that. I guess we need a lot more. Uh, modularity might make that happen, so that's pretty much my prediction and not, not a real wish. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd like to open up and flexibilize the JCP a lot more. And um, yeah, I think that would be a great thing to do next. I actually have another request, and this is uh, coming from you know, the Sundays. I just would like to see things defragmentize. You know, when, when Android forked, that was a big fork. You know, and it just bothers me, because there's no real technical reason why it's like that. It's, I mean, of course, if you talk to the Dalvik VM people, there are technical reasons, but those can be resolved. So I don't know. I just would like to see things come together again somehow. But of course, it's a very unlikely. <laughs> OK. And um, I'm going to make one, I don't know. I guess this is more of a request than a prediction. Um, so, so one thing which I think is cool that everybody can do as, as Java developers, and it's become increasingly accessible to you know folks to to do well we were talking about the sunspot earlier but um, the raspberry pi is a really good platform for for hacking and playing with embedded developments um, 3d printers are increasingly accessible like you can buy a, an entry level 3d printer for for around you know 500 euros or so um, and I think it's something where, as individuals, like it used to be a very high barrier of entry to actually build a product. Like build like, you know, the watches you guys have on. Like doing stuff like this used to actually be something you could only do for, as a company. But with all the capabilities you have to do small embedded development, it's actually possible to like create a Kickstarter project, build hardware, do like real projects that you can turn into essentially, you know, the future consumer electronics, wearables, all that stuff as hobbyists. So I think it's something really cool to experiment with as Java practitioners. It's a good point. And you're really exemplary at that. I mean, the stuff that you build for demos and shows is so impressive. So uh, it would be great to sort of somehow get the knowledge that you have about how to do that out into the 
community yeah. a little better. Yeah, because I've I, always looked at you and I'm like, my God, how does he crank that stuff out? That's may, awesome. Maybe I, should, maybe I should write a book or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing, though. The, another lamentation is that now uh, this has nothing to do with Java, but it has to do with books. And books are really not a thing anymore. You know, the, the, the notion of sitting down and writing a 500-page tome like, you know, Java Concurrency in Practice or JSF the Complete Reference or, you know, people don't do that anymore. Now they just go and look at 15-minute YouTube videos and can call it done. So there's no depth, you know? Yeah, so like on the, uh, we're watching a new community platform in OTN and we're actually, we have some articles on Java Embedded. Um, I re just reviewed one this morning on um, hooking up a GPS and a, um, um, a little chip which will do text to voice okay. over a speaker, both over serial to a Raspberry Pi. Um, and that's a really cool example. Like, a, you know, it basically the whole article was like five pages end to end with code, and you have a little text to speech widget which will get the GPS location and speak out stuff to you, which is really cool. That's cool. And like a lot of this stuff you can you can just pick up and easily do, like you don't need, I don't know, I, I failed all my EE courses in college. <laughs> but you don't need like electrical engineer, analog circuit design skills, you don't need a lot of the hardware expertise to build really cool, interesting projects. Yeah, that's the thing, in the early days of personal computing, you remember these stories from, from Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs hacking everything on the garage and they came up with the first Apple. And that was only possible because there was a community of hackers around in the early Silicon Valley. And now we got kind of like a resurgence of that with those small embedded devices or wearable devices now. They are very accessible to everybody and now we also have the possibility of program those devices using Java. Yeah. Java technology is there. So maybe the younger generations will be able to kickstart again these uh, uh, new things and they will be able to do it just because they have access to Java and these low level uh, or low cost devices. Cool. So I think this was a good tour through some of the past of Java, some of the highlights of the past 20 years of Java as well as future thoughts on where the Java platform may go. I want to thank all the folks here at the Geek Out conference who joined us for the live panel. And we have a bunch of other cool interviews coming up here the rest of the day. The next one is with Ed. We're going to chat about Servlet 4.0 coming up at um, 12.30. Um, Nitsen is also here. We're going to chat about lock-free queues. And Thomas will chat about asynchronous processing. So three more interviews lined up later in the day. But thank you, gentlemen, all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.